the best response you can have to a payoff in a thriller is someone goes, oh, right, I forgot, of course, I should have played this. On Story offers a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. All of our content is recorded live at Austin Film Festival and at our year-round events. To view previous episodes, visit OnStory.tv. OnStory is brought to you in part by the Alice Kleberg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. From Austin Film Festival, this is On Story, a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. This week's On Story, the Bernie Mac Show creator, Larry Wilmore. When people said, Larry, what did you do to be successful? I go, you don't understand, that's how I started. <laughs> because for me, doing what I wanted to do for a living made me a success. And then everything else was walking on that journey that I had set out for myself. So I'm not crestfallen if something doesn't happen. It's not devastating to me. It's just part of the journey. There's ups and downs on the journey. In this episode, Emmy award-winning television producer, Actor, comedian, and writer Larry Wilmore discusses his career from the Bernie Mac show to Insecure. I grew up in a real sports neighborhood. A lot of people in my neighborhood ended up playing pro sports and that kind of thing. So I was very competitive in that also, but I thought that's not really what I want to do. Once I kind of delved into theater and really dedicated myself to it, I realized about halfway through college that that's what I wanted to do for a living. So it's kind of where it started. But I, yeah. I was always kind of torn between like theater, you know, studying the classics and those types of things. And sometimes I would try stand-up comedy, too, which is completely different. Right. And I was always, even to this day, I kind of have those two tracks of my career, where one track is what I call that stand-up comedy track, whether it's doing talk shows or personal appearances. Even this kind of falls in that, although this kind of blends the line. And then the other track, which is more storytelling and theater and those roots, you know, the dramatics and all that stuff. And I love them both. I mean, it makes a lot of sense to me that you come from... A theater background, I mean, that yeah. you play a lot with structure right. in your works. I love that. Even when I did stand-up, I always played with form and structure and always was thinking of beginnings, middles, and ends, not just jokes, you know, and that kind of thing. You were a pretty serious uh theater guy for a little while. Yeah, so I was a very serious theater student. I was serious about it. You know, I wanted to, um, in college, um, I was nominated for the Irene Ryan Acting Award. I played, I did Oedipus, and I played the blind prophet, Tiresias. We had the Royal Shakespeare Company do a residency there, and I was like a puppy dog, like just, you know, out there just following them around. And, and I really, you know, worked on that. Um, very seriously and everything and thought, you know, I was going to be this actor and everything. But that other pull just kept doing it. I remember when I was underage, I would sneak into the comedy store and just stand in the back. And I remember seeing Richard Pryor come in and people like that. My eyes are so big um, and dreaming of doing that and not thinking that I'd ever be able to do it. So I was doing both of those things at the same time. Yeah. What were the first steps you took? Uh, well, it was a combination. So. Um, first professional gig that I got was at the Mark Taper Forum Theater in Los Angeles. I was in their improvisational theater project, and it was just a fluke audition. I was still in college at the time, and, and one of my professors said, hey, they read about this audition, and I looked like, and said, Larry, you look like you might be right for this. And I said, oh, okay, I'll go. I didn't have a picture or resume or anything. Yeah. And you had to do a little bit of everything. You had to move, you had to even sing, you had to improvise and all this stuff, I, which I cannot, I couldn't sing then, still can't sing, but you know, you fake it then or whatever. <laughs> But uh, I don't remember I did this dramatic scene, and I, I picked up the guy I was reading with, and I kind of threw him and says, Larry, that was great. You know, he just threw down the, the producer. I'm like, nah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but I was so innocent then. I swear to you, I was so innocent. Here's what I told them afterwards. 
<laughs> they said, well, how can we get in touch with you if we want to hire you? I said, well, I'm going to be out of town this weekend. I think I'm going to be in Santa Barbara. Can you imagine somebody saying this? <laughs> I said, I think I'm going to be in Santa Barbara. My friend's doing something. I don't really have a phone. I said, just give me your number. I'll just call you on Monday, you know. <laughs> this, is, this is Hollywood, right? Who says this? This is unmitigated goal, right? <laughs> right? But I didn't know any better. It really was innocent. I wasn't trying to do anything. And they said, OK. And they gave me their number. I can't believe they did it. And I said, cool, you know. So I left, not even thinking about it. And I remember that Monday, I go, oh, yeah, I should call those people, see what's going on, you know. <laughs> and I remember I called them. And they said, well, Larry, we don't want to give you this understudy part. And I go, OK, no problem. It was fun. I'm so glad. I did it and I started talking about and I'm thanking them. I go, no, 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 you don't understand. We want to give you one of the leads, an equity part. And I was like, ah. <laughs> and it was it was my break into showbiz. So I joined I joined Actors Equity and we wrote a play through improvisation. So it used a lot of the skills that I had. And it was something that we traveled around to high schools and we performed for kids. So it was actually my first type of mentorship thing at the time, which I didn't even know. And some of the schools we went into, some of the kids, it was amazing. We went into this one school for, I guess they called it troubled kids at the time. And you know, we did the show for them and they were transfixed. They just loved it. it I felt like nobody had done something special for them. That's right. what it felt like, right? And we would do a workshop after. And the power of what we were able to do for them always stuck with me for my whole career. The fact that you don't know what you're going to give somebody when you're doing what we're doing. There's more than just entertaining sometimes, you know, sometimes you're, you know, you're leaving something there, you know, right. that type of thing. So that was a big moment early in my career. And that was on the actor track. And then separately from that, I was trying stand up comedy in comedy clubs and doing that. So I was kind of doing that at the same time. What kind of stuff were you writing then? Or what were you talking about? Well, I was just, tr you don't know who you are at that moment. So you're just trying out jokes that feel, that you just feel are funny. So race definitely was the thing I would try to make jokes about, you know, some of my early jokes, um, which I mentioned a lot, um, where I talked about identity, where because I'm light skinned, people always ask me when I'm mixed with you, like, are you <laughs> mixed with? <laughs> Something, you know, and I would say, look, if I was a beer, I'd be a Negro light, okay? <laughs> you know? And I am a third less angry than the regular Negro, so it actually <laughs> kind of works out. So I'd do stuff like that. just jokes. I would catch them off guard, and I would do bizarre jokes too. I remember I did this one joke. I said I, I used to play practical jokes with my grandfather because he has a hearing aid. He said you could do this too. It's real fun. You get into a real good conversation with them. Then right in the middle of it, start talking like this. It kind of freaks them out. It's like, yeah, hey, right. I know what you mean. No, wait, no, no. I understand, but. Don't you agree? <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> so, you know that face a dog makes? He's like, <laughs> <laughs> and then I would segue, I would go, Reagan does that. Did you know that, you guys? I swear to God, have you seen it? Oh, man, when Reagan hears a sound he's never heard before, his head stops shaking. It's the most bizarre thing in the world. I've checked it out, though, man. I've seen it. I've seen it. <laughs> Compassion for the poor. That's an early political joke <laughs> from that. So I would, I would start with something silly, and then I would subvert it with something like political. So that's kind of what my act was like. One of the reasons why I dedicated so much time to stand-up comedy, because you're your own boss. You can work. You write an act, and you work. You know, As an actor, you're beholden to people hiring you and everything. Right. So writing stand-up really was a means to start a career and to own my career. And it taught me a huge lesson. And every time I've made a change in my career, I've taken that lesson of trying to take control of what I'm doing. When I jumped from performing to writing for television, it was in the interest of creating a space for myself because I felt Hollywood wasn't seeing me, that they couldn't see what I had. You know, they had their own view of what a black comic should be, and I just wasn't that. So I thought, well, I'm going to have to take control of what I'm doing and write a space for myself. And I was very inspired by people like Spike Lee, uh, Keenan Ivory Wayans, um, Robert, um, uh, Robert Townsend, the Hollywood Shuffle, all of that stuff, you know. Brainy Mike was first shot created by myself. So um, it was at a moment where I knew I just wanted to do something different, you know. And um, at the time on television were a lot of multi-camera shows. 
you know, Seinfeld, Friends were, I think, top of the shows. And I was looking at what was on TV also, and there was a lot of reality shows. Like, Real World was a completely different thing than what was going on in the sitcom world. Um, there was a show that really inspired me. It was called 1900 House, and it was a PBS special, and they rigged some cameras in a house, and people had to live as if it was 1900. I remember that. Yeah, and, they, and the whole show was just observing their behavior, and I thought, this is amazing, you know? <laughs> and they had a what was a confessional camera where you could go and confess your sins. Like, I ate a Snickers bar today. <laughs> I know it was wrong. I hate you, 1900, you know. <laughs> but I thought, that's fascinating, a confessional camera. That's interesting, you know. Yeah. And so I was looking at it, I was really drawn in. I thought, what if you did a show where it felt like that, you know, where it felt like you were just observing the people. It didn't feel like the action was being pushed out at you. It felt like you were eavesdropping, like you were a fly on the wall. And so I started thinking about that and developing that. And, and I thought it would be interesting to just rig cameras in a house and that kind of thing, you know. And so while I was thinking that idea, Kings of Comedy came out, and I saw a Bernie Mac's routine about taking in his sister's kid yeah. because <laughs> his sister was on crack. You know, I, I think you should be able to hit a kid in the stomach or the throat. Stomach or the throat. I will f a kid up. Don't get mad at me. I'm just saying what you can't say. You feel the same damn way out here. Kids smart for me. Sassy, talk his head, shaking. Talk to the hand, talk to the hand. So I'm from the old school, I'll kick a kid ass. When a kid get one years old, I believe you got the right to hit him in the throat or the stomach. And it was so funny, you know, he's talking about beating kids, you know, and all this stuff. And uh, I found, you know, first of all, Bernie was so funny. And I had met Bernie before and, and had talked about doing something together, I remember. But um, when I saw that, I thought, man, if I put that in this idea, I mean, that emotionally would draw me in, so it would give a sense of realism, and then I would believe what's going on. Because when I was first thinking about it, one of the hurdles was, how am I gonna, how's this gonna, what's gonna be a compelling story? I didn't know what a story was. I just had a setup. And so when I saw the Bernie thing, I go, ooh, that's a, that's a compelling emotional story there. I wanna know what's gonna happen to those kids, you know? I like, I already, I have empathy for them. There's pathos already built in there. So I thought there was some juice in that, you know? And so I pitched it to Bernie, and uh, you know, I came up with some ideas for it. I saw the camera almost as a character, and the, using the house as a character, and how he would speak to the camera and that type of thing. He did this thing in his act, and he would say, "South Carolina, you know how Bernie Mac feels. You know, come on, South Carolina, South Carolina, we family, we family. You know." And I thought that's great how Bernie t he takes the whole city and he treats them like his family. And he actually did that in person too. I went to Vegas with him. I was just doing some homework, observing how his fans kind of treat him, and he treated everybody like they were part. How you doing, man? Yeah. How's it going? You know. And I'm thinking, does he know this person? <laughs> like he's gonna say, "How's those bunions, man? How's that going?" <laughs> But, um, and people acted like that with him and everything. So I thought it'd be interesting if he said that to America and treated America like the way to South Carolina. America, you know how Bernie Mac feel. America, you know, you know I wouldn't do that to them kids. You know, you know what I'm, America, you know what I'm saying. Bernie Mac just say what you want to say, but you can't. I'm just, I'm just doing something for you, America. And just to have, so I thought, well, that would be interesting because now you can have this kind of this intimate relationship going on in the camera. It's not really for exposition. It's really for intimacy. It's really yeah. to, you know, have the character express some things in a certain way to move the story along on an emotional kind of track, you know, which was interesting. So those were the origins of it. Yeah. You sort of touched on this a little bit, but at the time there, this was one of the only single cam right. sitcoms. How did you swing that? Did you it was very <laughs> difficult. It was very, very difficult. It was one of the hardest things I did. First of all, I had to convince Bernie, but he got on board easily. But here's what I knew. Bernie Mac in front of an audience was amazing, right? If I put him in front of an audience in a sitcom, it's going to feel watered down with a live audience. That was just my opinion, because I felt I couldn't compete with the stand-up comedian Bernie Mac if they're both in front of an audience. So I thought, I need to show Bernie in a different way, take him down a notch, use a different speed, let people get in here, rather than have all that. You know? So that was my concept of it. Now Fox, on the other hand, wanted to have an audience. You know, they, wanted to, they did not want it to be single camp, so I fought them all the way. I did everything from lie about certain things, you know. <laughs> do, oh, there were so many things I did, you know. And uh, 
And then finally they said, okay, maybe we could just do the parts where he talks to the camera in front of it. And I was like, now how am I going to say no to this? You know? <laughs> and I, oh, it was so hard. And looking back, I understand where they're coming from. They're not wrong to want to have Bernie in front of an audience, right? I knew it would ruin the show, though. It would just ruin it. It would ruin the whole feel and everything. So somehow, I, I can't remember what I said, but I got them to not do that. I think I, I made up some big lie about something about, oh, well, I don't even want to say it at this point. <laughs> you know. But they believed it, thank God. Yeah. I got through it. Um, <laughs> they fought me all the way, unfortunately. But when the show aired, people really responded to it. You know, they really took it in a way where it felt it it felt real to them, and that's what I wanted. You know, in fact, when Ken Ken Quapis had directed it, he directed um, Larry Sanders' pilot as well. Ken Quapis and I had discussions. We were talking about French New Wave films. Um, you know, we were looking at Breathless, even 400 Blows, some of that stuff, some of the style, some of the cutting style we were looking at. You know, and we were having, those are the kind of discussions we were having. Si vous n'aimez pas la montagne, si vous n'aimez pas la ville, allez vous faire foutre. Didn't I tell you don't touch none without my permission? You didn't say the phone. I didn't say the phone. You said don't touch the TV, VCR, the DVD, your old school, your new school, and your heavy rap. But you never said we can touch the phone. Technically, she's right. Technically. You've collaborated with some amazing people. Can you talk a little bit about, about your process of collaboration? Mm -hmm. Maybe let's talk about Insecure. Sure. Collaborating with Issa Rae. Yeah, Insecure. Um, I love collaborating. Collaborating is interesting. I think because I'm a natural collaborator when I was never always confident in my own voice uh, coming up. Even as a stand-up, I, I always felt better writing jokes for somebody else. <laughs> I, would, I wrote jokes for a lot of friends and stuff. So I, I'm kind of a natural collaborator. It was always harder for me to be myself in that kind of thing. Um, but collaborations aren't always easy. They can be tough. You know, you learn a lot through them. When I was, uh, when I met Issa, the HBO had inquired if I wanted to supervise her, kind of be, kind of the godfather or whatever, looking at it, oh, very good, good job, keep doing more of that, you know, whatever, you know. <laughs> but uh, I watched Awkward Black Girl and I fell in love. I was like, oh my God, this is fantastic. She really has a point of view, you know, she's good, a good performer too, you know, really has a good eye for things. And the tone I thought was really nice. And when we met, we just hit it off personally. You know, we were just making each other laugh. It was really a lot of fun. And I said, do you want to just write this together? Because I really don't want to supervise you. And she was like, OK. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so we decided to do that. And we spent a uh, couple months uh, the summer of 2013. I had this apartment in downtown LA. There was a, um, kind of an area where the pool was, and you could kind of see the city. We just went up there every, <laughs> every day and just made each other laugh and scooped out story and life and me asking her a thousand questions about who she was and all that stuff and and doing that and it was really fun because it was both me finding a show but also respecting what she already had and not wanting to make that mine or interpret it as mine but try to protect that and collaborate into something that works. Does that make sense? Yep. So I almost I wanted to be I wanted to be the protector of the thing that she had that was special and collaborate on that, you know. Well, if the Bernie Mac show you would describe as not negotiating with these terrorist children, what's the... I don't know who insecure? I am or where I'm going. And that is in every scene of Insecure. Right. You can go to every scene. These people have no idea what they're doing. Right. <laughs> I always say they're on a... They're on a train to nowhere, and they're and they're getting their tickets to get there as fast as they can. Yeah. <laughs> so that sense, you could see it in even in Issa's acting. There's always an unsureness, you know. She she does not make the right. People get mad and say, "How come Issa did that?" That's the point. Yeah. <laughs> that actually is the point. She doesn't know. Yeah. She has to make mistakes. She has no choice. That is her journey, you know. And when she stops, show over, I guess, yeah. you know. But but that's exactly what the show is at. And it came from a lot of our conversations and me asking about that age and what's going on with her generation and that kind of stuff and and feeling that, you know, I remember when we landed on that, I said, you know, we should make this show 
this, you know, come from that point of view, you know. And then the humor goes on top of that and comes out of that too and all that kind of stuff, silly right. jokes. But that's how you build it. You start with that, you hold under that for dear life and you can build things on top of that. <laughs> Issa. What are you doing? What? Oh, I was just asking him, Siri, where Malcolm Jamal Warner was born. It's Brooklyn. What are you even doing here? I thought you couldn't make it. I left her a message that said I could. And what the f is Daniel here? Because someone had dropped out and then Frida was like, oh, what about your friend Daniel? And I was like, oh, maybe. And then he came. What kinds of things did you learn on those other shows that were there pitfalls you wanted to avoid when you sort of finally had when or I did the Bernie Mac control. show? Yeah. Well, that was tough because I had to throw a lot of that out. I had to forget a lot of it because I knew I was dealing in another area there. And it took me a while to catch it. I t I've told this story before where it took me about three weeks. I wrote the same three pages and I would just stop and throw it out. I couldn't get past page three, stop. And I was in a Disney office. My, I had a Disney deal that had expired like a year earlier. So I was, I was squatting like in an office that wasn't mine. <laughs> I would just drive into like, mm -hmm. hey. <laughs> hey guys, how's it going? Man, is, is it gonna rain today? What's it going on? I would just drive on, you know, and I'd be terrified in there like I wasn't gonna get it done. And I'm like, why did I pitch this thing? Yeah. Now I'm cursing myself. I'm like, why did I pitch this? This is too crazy of an idea. This isn't a show. And I'm saying all these horrible things, you know. <laughs> and then finally, I remember in about the fourth week, for Christ's sakes, guys, the fourth week. Think of the torture on this, you know. I got to page four, okay? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> exactly. Persistence, man. And two years later, I got to page five. No, that's not the story. <laughs> but then it just, something clicked. I, I caught the right tone. I caught exactly the right tone, and it just clicked. And it poured out of me like in 36 hours, the whole script just poured out. And then that script ended up winning an Emmy like two years later, that actual script, yeah. Persistence, and I almost gave up. I swear to God, guys, I almost gave up. I swear to you, I wasn't fake crying. I was in desperate emotional distress where I was like that psychic pain, and I was like, why did I do this? <laughs> and thinking my career was over, what was I thinking? And then you turn on the TV, it's all these shows, hey, you know, all that stuff, you know? I'm like, why am I not writing that, you stupid fool, you know? <laughs> and then that one day, it just came through and just changed my whole career. Do you, was there an epiphany or just like? Definitely, just all the work, snapped. all that homework that I had done yeah. finally caught up to my fingers, right. you know. Here, here's was my, one of my epiphanies. I was watching Real World, I had like, like a lot of Real World tapes, and I would watch, here's the moment that got me. I'm looking at the act break, and I'm thinking, okay, in traditional sitcoms, you start a story, usually very heavily plot driven. Most sitcoms, many sitcom writers don't even know are built on farce, you know, I'm the theater major, so I know, I know these different forms, right? And, you know, there's some information that's being hidden in farce or somebody doesn't know something and there's hijinks, you know, and, and you know, you, you, there's heightened action at the end of the acts, which is kind of artificial because it's really meant to just sell soap. So I, I was thinking about the artifice of that, you know, and I was looking at it and I was like, man, how come in real world there's no, like, plot twist at the, at the commercials? They just go to commercial. And I kept playing. I'm like, they, why, why do I want to watch this? Yeah. That's the question I kept asking myself. So why do I want to come back? What is it? And then one day I just looked and I go, hmm, maybe I, I, I'm just interested in what's going on with this character and I just want to see more. That simple. I mean, it's, yeah. does it, isn't that crazy? I realized that what I was connecting to was this emotional journey the character was experiencing. Yes. Which is kind of a magic of all good reality shows. That's what you're hooked into. Everything else is, it doesn't matter. It's really that emotional thing that's going on. You know, you're kind of hooked into that. You've been watching a conversation with Larry Wilmore on On Story. On Story is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's On Story project, including the On Story PBS series, now streaming online, the On Story radio program, the On Story podcast, and the On Story book series, available where books are sold. To find out more about On Story and Austin Film Festival, visit onstory.tv or austinfilmfestival.com.
the best response you can have to a payoff in a thriller is someone goes, oh, right, I forgot, of course, I should have played this. On Story offers a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. All of our content is recorded live at Austin Film Festival and at our year-round events. To view previous episodes, visit onstory.tv.